Turn with me then in your Bibles to that most Christmassy of chapters, Luke chapter 2, and then we'll turn after that to Matthew chapter 4. So Luke chapter 2, and we'll read from verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the, city, out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Now they were in the same country, shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Saviour who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took, up in his arms, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. Amen. We'll leave that there. Now turn with me to Matthew and chapter 4, and we'll read the first 11 verses. This comes immediately after the baptism of the Lord Jesus, where it says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, afterward he was hungry. 
Now when the tempter came to Jesus, he said, Since you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But Jesus answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, Since you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands he shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Amen. May God bless, then, the reading of his word to us as we seek to understand these marvellous things that he has done for us. Turn with me, then, in your Bibles to Mark's Gospel and chapter 1, and we'll read the first uh, 13 verses, and then we'll hear what the Lord has to say to us in them. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and to loose. I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately, coming up from the water, John, uh, sorry, yeah, I think it's John saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon Jesus like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. We saw this morning from this same passage, and we didn't get all the way through it, that God has come to us. God has come to us. We saw that, didn't we, from verse 3, where John is preaching and he's quoting from Isaiah chapter 40, uh, when he says, make straight the way of the Lord, prepare the way of the Lord your God. And Isaiah 40, we read the whole thing this morning, and I was quite blessed by it. I trust you were as well. It contains some of the highest speech about God in all the Old Testament. Speak so highly of him, as the one beyond compare, the creator, the king, the one full of power and glory who made and sustains the heavens, God. And uh, we mentioned, didn't we, that we can't stand before that God. He's so powerful, he's so great, so overwhelming, so pure and holy. We can't exist in his presence uh, because of how lowly and earthly and sinful we are. How did uh, Martin Luther put it? I can't remember it now. Go and see that infant who made and sustained the heavens and the earth. 
We said that when God comes to us, we said this this morning, God has come like us. He's come to us and he's come like us. That when this God, the Lord that John is talking about and preaching about, appears, it says in verse 9, Jesus came. Jesus came, as simple as that. When he appears, it's just a man like us. He is like us in all of our physicality. He's as human and as real and as flesh and blood and mind as we are. He's like us in our weakness and our frailty. And we remarked at the end, didn't we, this morning, that because of the incarnation, because of Christmas, because God has come to us like us, our everyday and day-to-day lives have now been touched, permanently touched and influenced, turned inside out by Jesus Christ. And we have to live now every day in reference to a uh, to an incarnate God, to a God who is flesh and bone, who is human, just like us. So God has come to us, he's come like us, and now this evening we'll see God has come for us. We see that especially in verses 10 to 13, that he's come for us. You see, God has come to us, yes, he's come like us, yes, but that wasn't for no reason, was it? It was for a purpose, he has come for us. We're going to speak a little bit about that now, but the the sort of theme that we'll, you'll hear ringing is he represents us. He's come to stand in our place. Uh, it's in that sense that we say he has come for us. Look at verses 10 to 13 then. What is it that this God does when he appears. God comes to us like us, but what does he do when he gets here? When he appears in Mark's advent, so to speak, what does he do? The first thing that he does says, Jesus came and was baptized by John in the Jordan. That's not what we really expect, is it? After all that John has just been preaching about and what we just spoke about this morning as well we talked about God coming like the launderer's soap like the refining fire come to scrub us all squeaky clean and to remove all the sin and the dirt and the filth he's come as John says elsewhere to thresh the floor that means to throw out all the rubbish all the dirt and keep just what is good he's come to judge the heavens and the earth remember how the son says the father has committed all judgment to him in John 5. So here comes God, the judge of the living and the dead, the creator. We might expect him to deal with those hypocritical Pharisees, to judge those rotten sinners, to even show up John the Baptist in all of his purity. That's what we're expecting. God to appear in glory. But when he appears, he's in the likeness of sinful flesh and he undergoes a baptism. Now that should shock us. It should shock us. Especially when we consider what sort of baptism this was. If I say to you what sort of baptism was it, what sort of things might you think? Think of it this way. Who is it that gets baptised? What sort of people? Look at verse 4. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And it says that all the people were coming confessing their sins and being baptized. Now that is a mystery. God has come to us. God has come like us. Here is God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, the perfect one, the spotless one, in whom there is no sin. The God of Isaiah 40, in all of that splendor and glory, undergoes a baptism of repentance. It's quite a mystery, and I don't need to tell you that massively thick books are written about it, exploring what that means but we can, we can go this far this evening with the time that we have that here is Jesus, here is God identifying himself even further with the sinners in whose form he has come. 
He takes the place of the guilty. He comes in the likeness of sinful flesh. We know, we confess, we believe and trust that it is true. He has no guilt. He has no sin. But see how close he comes to us who do have sin. How close he will come to the guilty that he undergoes even a baptism of repentance. One of the early fathers, you might uh, have worked out by now, I'm quite fond of them. He describes it like this. He says, it's, it's as if all of the sins washed off those sinners into the Jordan. And when Jesus was put underneath it, he, it all those sins washed onto him. Onto him, the Holy One. Here is the God of Isaiah coming to us, coming like us, and for us he washes himself with sinners as if he is one. We know that God, our triune God, calls from heaven to earth and calls all people everywhere to repent of their sins and to turn to Jesus Christ. And Jesus hears that call to repentance. And from within our own humanity, he replies, yes. Marvelous mystery. How low he stoops for us. But before we've wrapped our head around that amazing condescension of Jesus Christ, that he is baptized with a baptism of repentance in our place and for us, what else does he do? We've barely caught our breath after going through that with him and reading about that in verses 10 and 11. What happens then in verse 12? He doesn't just come for us in baptism, but for us he endures and resists the temptation of Satan. Who is it that gets tempted? What sort of people get tempted? It's people like us. People who have within ourselves a lilt towards sin. People who are uh, subject to the pull of sin. We are tempted. And so in undergoing a temptation, a further mystery, with even more big books written about it, here Jesus Christ, our God, identifies with himself even further with those who are made in temptable flesh. Again, he takes the place and stands in the stead of those who feel the pull of sin. He stands again with the guilty in their flesh, in their place, in their difficulty, in their temptation. What a mystery. What a mystery. The great tester of Malachi 3. Do you remember that? The laundress soap, the refining fire the great tester, the purifier, he steps into our world and he is tested by the fire of Satan's temptation for us. And for us, he overcomes and on our behalf. See how close God will step to us. Take a moment to recall those temptations. This is why we read from Matthew 4, because it tells us what those temptations were. Think about them for a moment. Who is it that Jesus is being, uh, rather, who is it that Satan is speaking to in those temptations? Is he speaking to one who is man or speaking to one who is God? Of course, we know Jesus is both man and God. But Satan speaks and he says, if you are, or since you are, the Son of God. He says, do a miracle. Make these stones bread. Prove yourself to be the Holy One by throwing yourself off the temple. Since you are God, take the power. Take the kingdoms of the earth. He's speaking to one who he recognizes as God. But since Jesus Christ is standing there in our place and for us, he doesn't reply as if from God's position. He replies from man, from within our own humanity, as one of us. You can put it like this. 
Satan spoke to God and a man replied for us with our words in our flesh quoting from the scriptures which uphold us. In verses 10 to 13 of Mark 1 where you have this baptism and this temptation of Jesus Christ we have the Lord before whom we must repent and he steps into our shoes of repentance. We have the one before whom we have no righteousness in ourselves because we are always giving in to temptation, always sinning. And he earns our righteousness for us. He withstands and endures and succeeds over temptation for us. And so we're talking, aren't we, about Jesus representing us sinners on earth. He comes to us to represent us. He comes like us in order to represent us. And he comes for us to represent us to the Father. He comes to us in our flesh and from that position of weakness and frailty and identity with us human beings. He obeys the Father where we fail, from where we fail. Even in our own weakness he succeeds. And this is what makes the baptism and the temptation of Christ not just amazing in themselves, but a rehearsal for the cross. Because in, the, in these words that we have here, in these events through which Jesus Christ went, we have him standing in the place of sinners before the Father to do the Father's will. Everything the Father tells us to do, he does it for us. We must repent and go through this baptism and Jesus stands in our place. We must not sin and do a temptation and stand firm and not go with the devil and he does it for us. We must die for our sins and he does it for us. It's marvellous. Now do you think that this is the way that it is at the beginning of his life? That he's representing us by taking on flesh and becoming human like us? Or is it just at the beginning of his ministry to show that this is what he's all about? Or maybe it's just at these crucial points, like baptism or temptation or the cross, that he represents us? Of course not, is it? It's all his life long. He lives for us. And dies for us. He lives his whole life in full obedience to the will of our Father. Think of it this way. How did the psalmist put it? He says, the Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men. Do you know this one? Psalm 14. To see if there are any who understand. Any who seek after God. And he's looking at all of humanity, every one of us. He's seeing, is there anyone here who knows me, who seeks me, who loves me? They have all turned aside, he says. They have all together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. But then looking at the human race, he sees Jesus Christ, his son. When he looks at him, he sees somebody who looks like you. Who looks like me. Who for us is keeping righteousness. Who is seeking God. Who does know him. And so representing us in our flesh. To fulfill all of our responsibilities. And to take all of our responsibility for our failure. Jesus Christ lives for us. At Christmas time, there's lots of talk about this fellow called Athanasius. He wrote lots of Christmassy sort of books, and uh, we'll talk about him a little bit on Wednesday. But he says that because we are sinners, we must die. But he says, because God is so good, because God is so full of life himself, he says it's not worthy of his goodness that we should die. We must live. So how do we solve that problem? Because we're sinners, we must die. Because God is good, we must live. The problem is solved when God the Father sends his Son into the world, 
in our flesh to live for us and to die for us. For us, he went to the cross and bore the wrath of God on sin. And because he's just like us, we die in him. For, for us, he was buried in a grave. God was buried in a grave, just like we are. And because he is like us, we are buried with him. Here's Athanasius again. He says, it was our sorry state, our mess, he says, that caused the word of God to come down. It was our transgression that called out his love for us. Taking a body like our body, because all our bodies were subject to death, he surrendered his body to death instead of us all and offered it to the Father for us. And for us, that flesh and blood didn't just live, didn't just die, but was raised incorruptible. And because he's just like us, we are raised in him. Where is that flesh and blood now? Right now, at this instant, while we're gathered in this building here in Mysore that same skin, that same bone, that real human body is sitting down on the throne of glory and it is sitting there for us. Isn't that amazing? Right now, at this instant, hair like ours, and mine is standing on end, hair like our hair is cushioning a head like our head from the crown of universal glory, from the crown of God. Right now, hands like ours and fingers like ours are wrapped around a scepter of limitless power and it's for us. Before God our Father in heaven is forever and ever his wonderful eternal Son whom he loves, he says in verse 11. You are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And because of Christmas he's looking at someone who looks like you, who looks like me. And we are in him. And he says, you are my son, in whom I am well pleased. You know, think about this for a moment. When the Lord Jesus was raised from the dead for us and ascended into glory for us, he was about to enter heaven for us. And stepping towards those gates of heaven, he heard coming over the gates of heaven these words from the Psalms. Lift up your heads, O you gates. The angels singing, lift up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. And there's a response, isn't there? Who is this King of glory about to come into heaven to sit on the throne? It is the Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. And those golden doors swing open and in walks immortal God, the Lord of hosts. And he is a human like us. The father looks upon him and sees his own son who is like us, but without sin and with all righteousness that he has earned. You know, it's true that at Christmas we remember how God comes to earth to us and like us but it works forever and ever now like that now the Lord Jesus goes into heaven for us and like us and he sits down on the throne of the father like us and for us and forever and ever and ever now there is a member of the trinity who is like us and for us now, of course, I say this all sermon long, that he is for us and he does all of these things for us. But is that automatic? 
Because Jesus did this, does that mean that all people everywhere automatically enjoy all of his benefits? Well, that's a big question. I sort of regret asking it. There's a sense in which Jesus did do all of these things for all people everywhere. A glorious sense in which that is true. But it is only in as far as we are tied to the Lord Jesus Christ that all these things are for us truly and fully and wholly in their entire sense. We can illustrate it perhaps like this. I don't know if you've ever gone to um, a concert somewhere and you can get like a sort of little badge, can't you, to say I'm coming into this concert, I've bought a ticket or whatever. But some people might have VIP written on and they can go further. They can go closer to the stage or they can uh, go backstage and meet the musicians or whatever it might be. And if you're tied to that VIP, if you're with them all the time, then you get to go with them wherever they go. You get all of their benefits. It's as if they are there for you. And so it is when you are joined to the Lord Jesus, when you're tied to him, united to him, when he dies, you die. Where he lives, you live. Where he reigns, you reign. Jesus Christ did die and live for all. But he carries the sin of only those who will repent and believe in him. Do you believe in him? In these amazing days that we're reading about and hearing about and singing about, John the Baptist preached, God is coming. And then Jesus came. And here we are all these years later and we're still preaching the same message. God is coming. He's coming quickly. And one day, Jesus will come to us, for us, like us again. But that time, the sky will unroll like a scroll. You will hear trumpets. You will see fire and smoke and cloud and glory and angels and the works. You won't need anyone to tell you who he is. And the question still remains that when God comes to you, when he sees you and sees straight through you and knows you inside out, will he see you as you are? Will he see you as you are in your sin, as it were, self-prepared with all the hoarded works that you could do? As best as you can make yourself look. Or when he looks at you, looks at you, will he see someone who, by repentance of sin and living daily life looking at the Lord Jesus, instead of looking like you, you look like him. You look like his spotless son in whom he is well pleased. It's a Christian privilege to know this saviour, isn't it? And it's a Christian duty to make all of daily life now about that God, Jesus, who has come to us, has come like us, has come for us. To live every day for him, since after all, he lives every day now for us. Amen. I'm just going to read a few words from the book of Acts and then we'll pray and sing to close. These words come from Acts in chapter 10 where Peter is speaking to Cornelius' household and he says from verse 36, the word which God sent to the children of Israel preaching peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. 
And we are witnesses of all these things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, who they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive the remission of sins. Amen. May God bless us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, please receive our thanks and praise and adoration as we kneel before you and are dumbstruck by all you have done for us in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord God of heaven and earth, for coming to us, even in the likeness of our sinful flesh, for undergoing a baptism in our place, for being tempted and succeeding where we consistently fail. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for going to the cross for us, to hang there for us and like us under our condemnation and to bear our sin away. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for with delight obeying the law and then enduring amazing pain whilst all our sorrows on thee lay. Lord God in heaven, receive our thanks and praise for your own name's sake and help us now to Uh, live our lives confessing and repenting of our sin and looking forward to your coming that we might be made in your image thank you then father for being so good to us in your gospel we pray these things and thank you in jesus name amen